And we're now joined in studio by Daniel Cohen, a research fellow at Israel's INSS. Thank you for being here with uh, me this afternoon. This attack, the attack in Orlando, is being termed as a lone wolf attack. This is something that we're much more familiar with, or a term that's used more generally here in Israel. Exactly. Um, I even will say that there's a kind of model of learning in Israel of uh, Palestinian terror organizations, learning and influencing by what ISIS has been doing for the last two years, using this kind of uh, tactics for terror attacks. It means that there is an incitement online 24-7, fueling and uh, poisoning the minds and hearts of people that are, in this case, fanboys of the Islamic State, to go out and do this kind of attack when they don't have, need any of the intelligence and any organization behind it. So the definition of lone wolf attacks actually lies on inspiration, probably. That happens online. You're also an, an expert on uh, uh, social networks. How, how do we see a link between what's happening in the Palestinian authorities and these lone wolf attacks and these that are ISIS driven is there a similarity and how how is it uh, uh, seen and expressed give the example of the two common dominators doing the attacks by this ISIS lone wolf attackers for the last uh, two years uh, we're now celebrating the uh, second year of the declaration of the Islamic State now last year also in the first year it's also the first week of the Ramadan we saw a call by the spokesperson of ISIS to his fanboys to go out on this kind of attack. Now it, go, it goes viral to people that already are influenced by video, beheading videos, but other videos also, the tweet, the journal of uh, the Islamic State. And when they, uh, after they're like seeing it again and again and again and repeatedly, it like affects their minds and then they go out like a, in a, a different mental state. Because we're seeing these lone wolf attacks, as they're called, throughout the world. Even in uh, uh, the blast that took place in Beirut yesterday, there is a, a suspected, uh, 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 they are suspecting that it was a lone wolf attack, which means they were inspired online. And another phenomena we're seeing worldwide, I would say, is parents that are very much surprised or shocked at the actions of their own children. So could it be that because these messages are, in fact, going over online and and going viral and inspiring or affecting the users themselves that there wouldn't necessarily be uh, an expression in their day-to-day -day life exactly and parents really don't know what happening with the kids when they're in the room and they... that there wouldn't necessarily be uh, an expression in their day-to-day -day life exactly and parents really don't know what happening with the kids when they're in the room and they like watching uh, videos on the computers. There's one famous attack, uh, the Axeman in New York subway, that went into his room for two days, saw 278 videos of ISIS. Same time there was a call to go out and do this kind of attack, like in the dawn of the dead. He took an axe, went into the subway and attacked police officers. Now his father said he didn't want to eat, didn't want to drink, he was just like sitting in his room and watching videos and didn't know what's going on there. And I have to ask you, are some of these games being banned? I mean, is, is there any legislation? Because we know, especially in Israel, the, the challenge and the difficulty of the security for, uh, services to tackle these sort of attacks. So what sort of action can be taken and is any action being taken against this specific form of attack? First of all, there is a huge debate now between the Silicon Valley and security forces like the FBI about privacy and anonymity. What, where you can like hack into, what you can monitor, and when the company sees something, how they can like report it to the FBI, for example, or to the NSA, or in our case, to the security forces in Israel. And now, currently, are, are they cooperating with the authorities? Because we do know about cases that were with Facebook where under no means were they willing to jeopardize their users' privacy, even at the price of the greater safety and security. For now, for now there's no legislation, there's no like, guidelines for the companies. The companies are trying to do things that on their own, but they do not report it to the security establishment. In Israel, it's even a harder challenge because in most cases it, it's happening in the Palestinian territories and not inside Israel, so it's even harder. But we see uh, new technologies embraced by uh, security establishment together sometimes with uh, outsourcing for private companies. I'll give you one example, uh, monitoring 
of uh, sentiments online on Facebook, for example, looking for keywords, then doing this analyzation to big data tools and uh, creating like a list of people that are potentially uh, go out and do this kind of attacks. So there is like a, we see it is still a, a big, big challenge, but we see like a progress in technology. There's progress. And what do you think the U.S. can take from Israel in this regard? Israel in this wave of terror uh, did uh, like a collaboration between the Shin Bet, the police and the army to try to like uh, predict from one side of it and from the other side of it to look on incitement online and try to like understand if someone is like like saying like a farewell to his family on Facebook maybe tomorrow morning he will go out and do this kind of attack. So Israel got pretty good on it for now. And that are we seeing many new cyber units? in uh, the army and in the, the, the different uh, um, uh, government uh, offices as we see in Israel. Is the same being replicated in the United States and throughout Europe? We see now in uh, the U.S. Uh, US uh, Cyber Command started to use cyber bombs, as they say, against ISIS, also against recruitment uh, to ISIS, uh, attacks on servers and on uh, sites that can, like, again, influence uh, people uh, to go out and commit this kind of attack. Now, maybe the other side of it that we don't see yet, we see cyber warfare, but we don't see efficient uh, counter-narrative campaigns, maybe to, like, for the long term, uh, to educate people and to try to show them alternatives to don't go out and do this kind of As attack. The answer be might be more in education than in legislation because it's very hard to predict one individual's actions and, and their, uh, uh, their intentions in doing so. Yes, but to see, I can give you one example from uh, Chicago Police Against Crime. They like, identified the list of uh, potential criminals by uh, region, uh, communities, uh, socioeconomic uh, issues. And they could create this kind of list of potentially people that would go out and do crimes. Then they like try, uh, to support them with community services and social services and provide them alternatives not to go out and do it. And uh, hopefully we will see the same in uh, using cyber tools against terrors in communities and uh, people that are families of the Islamic State, for example, that for now nothing is being done against them. This is exactly the case of Orlando. He was on some kind of list. There was, uh, it was suspected by uh, ties to ISIS or to people that are part of ISIS. And he was later Nothing cleared was without any action taken or exactly. proactive action from the government, whether it be uh, security or educational towards him, something that will hopefully change. Daniel yeah. Cohen, thank you very much for joining me this Thanks. afternoon.